Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you another in their exciting new series of broadcasts on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Each week, Hallmark brings you true-to-life stories of actual persons who, in their own way, have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Presented by our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore, on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight, we pay a double tribute to William Dunlap, founder of the American Theater, and to a great and good friend of Hallmark, who is celebrating his completion of 60 successful years as star of stage, screen, and radio. The dean of the American Theater today, our own host and narrator, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Well, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, Frank. I, I just want to say that I'm particularly happy that my 60th year in the theater finds me associated with Hallmark cards in such a fine dramatic series as the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And I'd like to add that all of us who are active in the theater owe a special debt of gratitude to the man whose true and fascinating story we're telling tonight. William Dunlap, father of the American theater. And now, a message from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to remember your friends, there's one way to be sure the card you send receives an extra welcome. Look for that identifying Hallmark on the back when you select it. For words to express your feelings and designs to express your good taste, let the Hallmark on the back be your guide. For that Hallmark tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical Small Town Girl, starring Jane Powell and Polly Granger. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the first act of our Hallmark Hall of Fame. In the America of today, the drama is one of the liveliest of the arts. But once, there was a time when the American theater scarcely existed. We were without playwrights, producers, or actors, and theaters. In fact, when the Revolutionary War ended, the law in many of the new United States actually prohibited the performance of any type of stage play. To see a professional play performed by competent actors, one had to cross the Atlantic to England. And so it is to England that we turn first. It's in 1785, and the beautiful Sarah Siddons is making theatrical history at London's Drury Lane Theatre. The performance is over now, and Mrs. Siddons returns to her dressing room. As she closes the door, she realizes that she's not alone. Tall, handsome youth steps forward and bows respectfully. My apologies for this intrusion, madam. I bribed your attendants to allow me to enter. Who are you, sir, and what is your business? William Dunlap, madam. And with your permission... A humble gift from a devoted admirer. Well, a portrait of me. Yes, and in the role of Desdemona. You painted it? Yes, madam. Well, how very nice. Forgive my presumption that I should attempt to capture the same beauty which has inspired such artists as Gainsborough and Sir Joshua Reynolds. My dear boy, you're much too young for such elegant speeches. Do you always talk like that? <laughs> No, I, uh, I memorized it. <laughs> and it sounded like it. How old are you? Nineteen. I see. And now, Mr. Dunlap, what do you really want of me? Hmm? A recommendation, perhaps? An introduction to some possible patron or teacher of art? Well, I have a teacher, ma'am. Benjamin West. Benjamin West? Well, then you're in the best of hands. But come now, what do you want? To become an actor, to, to live 
and eat and breathe the theater. But why? You're a painter. Well, I was, madam, until I had the privilege of seeing you act. But now, now the theater is my only dream. If I had only known before, but... You see, in America, we have no stage. Oh, then you're an American. Now I understand. Then please, if you will help me. Perhaps I can join your company. If I cannot act, then I shall write plays for others to perform. Mr. Dunlap, you're very young. Young like your nation. I suggest that if you truly love the theater, and if you have talent, that you go back to America. Share your ambitions with your own people. England may not need you, but your country does. In due time, young William Dunlap follows the advice of England's great actress. He returns to New York City and to an angry father. The theater? What theater? May the day never come when this country suffers such contamination. I'm sorry, father. I'd hoped you would understand. I understand this, William. I've brought you up to be a gentleman, not to be an associate of the uncouth and ungodly actors. They're no better than wandering gypsies and cut purses. But you've never met any, Father. Mrs. Siddons is a great actress, and she's one of the finest ladies in England. I am not going to argue with you, William. You're a painter with a brilliant career ahead of you. What other artist can say, as you can, that at the age of 17, he painted the portrait of General George Washington? Well, this is important, my boy. It assures you the best of clients. It tells society that you're a gentleman. And a gentleman you will remain. But suppose I choose not to be what you call a gentleman. Suppose I give up art. Can you? How would you live? If you do not paint portraits, you must become my partner in business. I see no other choice. Uh, It's for you to decide. Well, there is no other choice for young William. Not for a while. Better to earn a living as a portraitist than to become a junior partner in his father's China importing company. So William Dunlap opens a small portrait studio. A studio soon familiar to the ladies and gentlemen of society. It's there that William first meets Elizabeth Woolsey. According to the strict fashion of that day, The lovely Elizabeth is chaperoned by a mother who sits to one side and reads a book while the painter executes her daughter's portrait. Miss Woolsey, uh, a bit more tilt to the chin, please. Like this? Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Mr. Dunlap. Uh, Yes, Mrs. Woolsey. I am relying upon you to complete this commission by our next visit. I'm afraid that's impossible, ma'am. Impossible? Mr. Dunlap, this is my daughter's seventh sitting for you. Our patience is exhausted. Well, I'm sorry, ma'am, but your daughter's eyes present a problem. Yes, I've noticed that. Elizabeth, your gaze is supposed to be to the left, I believe, not at Mr. Dunlap. Yes, ma'am. Oh, there's a carriage. I'll uh, tell your father we'll be out directly. Darling. Oh, be careful, William. She may see. I don't care. It's time we told her. No, no, not yet. Oh, William, you mustn't keep on delaying. You've just got to finish my portrait. Well, then how shall I see you? Well, I'll think of an excuse. I... Wait. You can do Mother's portrait. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'd be delighted, of course. Of course. Oh, William. Tell me again. I love you. We interrupt this program. We have interrupted this program to bring you a bulletin from CBS Radio News. The first group of sick and wounded Allied prisoners of war is now being turned over to the United Nations Command by the Communists in Korea. For a direct report, we switch now to Freedom Village, Korea, George Herman reporting. This is Freedom Village. We have two more names of prisoners who have been returned to the United Nations. The first is PFC Armand Noland, like in Senator Noland. He's from Rackville, New York. He was in the 2nd Division, the 38th Infantry, captured at Kunuri. The second is PFC Marvin L. Brown. He is from Oklahoma City. This is Freedom Village, and now returning you back to the United States. You are just... It's just that 
Well, you've never said anything about this before. From CBS Radio News. At 10.30 Eastern Time tonight, over many of these stations, CBS Radio News will present a special program including the names and home addresses of all American prisoners of war exchanged up to that time. We now resume our regularly scheduled program. You sound like my father. Perhaps I should have mentioned this before. Yes. Yes, you should have. Elizabeth, we can't argue about something which you don't understand. How can you know what the theater really is? It, it doesn't exist in this country. You've never seen a real play. But I have. I've seen several delightful little skits. They were amateur performances in our own home, oh, acted by genteel people, by our friends. And badly done, I'm sure. Can't you see, Elizabeth? I want to bring the real theater to the people. Uh, Mr. Dunlap. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry, sir. I wasn't aware. Yes, that some... we are not intruding, sir. General George Washington extends his compliments. <gasps> William. General Washington. My respects, Mr. Dunlap. Much has happened for all of us since that day you painted my portrait in the army camp. Indeed there has, sir. Uh, General Washington, may I present Miss Elizabeth Woolsey? Your servant, Miss Woolsey. I'm honored, sir. I'll be brief, Mr. Dunlap. I have here several miniatures of my wife and children. I should appreciate it if you might be able to make a set of copies. It'll be a pleasure, sir. I wish to present the copies to my friend General Lafayette. Uh, if you might have them ready on my return to New York for my inauguration. Certainly, sir. Thank you. May I add a word of friendly counsel? Uh, yes, of course, General. I overheard your remarks concerning the theater. I share your interest in that subject and also your concern. The English and French and German languages are rich in the works of great dramatists, but unfortunately we can only read them and imagine their true power when acted by great interpreters. I agree, sir. Then let nothing dissuade you, sir, from your ambition. Bring these works to life for us. Give the people pleasure and education. Bring us the wisdom and the inspiration of great thinkers, which all of us shall need in the days still before us. It may not be easy, sir. It may be very hard. It will be hard. And yet for me, there can be no turning away. I shall do all that is possible, and even what is thought impossible. You have my word, General Washington. In just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Last week, I had occasion to go through a trunk in the attic which belonged to my grandmother, and as I searched, I found dozens of little treasures which her children had given to her through the years. They were small things of no value to anyone except a mother, like notes and pictures and cards. And yet, it occurred to me that all of us try, in every generation, to tell our mothers just how much we think of them. In fact, that's why Mother's Day was established years ago. On the second Sunday in May, we take time out to express our feelings toward our mother with thoughtful messages that come right from the heart. And that's why I think you'll enjoy selecting your Mother's Day card from the new Hallmark Collection. You'll find appropriate Hallmark Mother's Day cards for every taste. Beautiful, warm-hearted cards with words that say what you want to say, just the way you want to say them. And here's something nice to remember. When your card is read and closed, the familiar Hallmark and crown on the back will give it added meaning, for it says... You care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of William Dunlap. For young William Dunlap, there are two all-consuming ambitions in life. To marry the lovely Elizabeth Woolsey and to be a part of the theater an artistic institution still unheard of in the America of 1789. In that year, William and Elizabeth are married. In the months that follow, William half-heartedly pursues his career as a portrait painter. More and more of the time, he's away from the studio. And then one day, he returns to find his father and Elizabeth waiting for him. William, I didn't want to come here, but your father insisted. I did indeed. Your husband's future is your concern as well as mine. I presume, Father, that you've heard something to upset you. I have. First, William, perhaps you will explain where you've been all afternoon. 
At a coffee house. At a coffee house. And uh, yesterday afternoon? And the day before that? At the coffee house. Yeah. At least you are truthful. But meanwhile, how do you expect to support your wife? How many portraits have you painted in the past month? Only one, sir. This. This is a friend of mine, Charles Cooper. Hmm. Hungry-looking individual in a patched front coat. And from his appearance, I'm sure he can hardly afford to pay you your commission. <laughs> that would be quite impossible. He's an actor. You say, Elizabeth, actors. Those are his coffee house friends. They are, sir. I need their advice on the play I'm writing. A play? My boy, if you would do portraits of ladies and gentlemen of fashion, you must end this bizarre way of life. You cannot afford the risk. Elizabeth. Yes, William? I can see that this does involve you. I want to know how you feel. Then I think you should give up your painting. Darling. At least for a while, William. Your father's still willing to make you a partner in his business. Don't refuse him again. Oh, I see. Mm, thank you, Elizabeth, thank you. And between us, we'll make a proper young man of him yet. And wealthy. And when he is, Mr. Dunlap, I'm going to be the first to tell him, buy your own theater, William. And present your own plays. Make your theater come true. Elizabeth. Oh, my darling. And so, William Dunlap becomes a man of business. But only during the daylight hours, long into the night, this man of determination sits at his desk writing and rewriting his play, which he calls The Father of an Only Child. Finally, it's completed and actually produced. It means fame, yes. But money, no. Eight more years of struggle are to pass before William Dunlap, businessman, becomes William Dunlap, theatrical producer. It is in 1796 that he's the owner of New York's only theatrical concern known as the Old American Company. One evening, he's watching the performance from backstage. Will, Will, tell him to close the curtain. Get everybody off stage. Why, what's wrong, Charles? Wrong. Look up at the balcony. Charles, keep that curtain open. I'm going out there. No, Will, come back. Besides, everyone is safe. Now it's the next morning. William and Elizabeth stumble through the blackened ruins. Elizabeth buries her head against her husband's shoulder and sobs her heartbreak. Gone. Everything gone. Yes, everything. Theater, money, even the partnership with my father. The partnership? But a man is forced into bankruptcy. Everything is taken. I'm sorry, my dear. I've failed. No, no, darling. How can you say that? What you've done once, you can do again. Then you're not discouraged? I was, but only for a moment. So long as we have each other, Will, and the children, nothing else matters. No, I'm not discouraged. Then neither am I. Let them take everything. I still know how to write and paint. And that's our answer, Elizabeth. With pen and brush, I'll make a new theater rise from these ruins. A finer theater for all of us. And so, William Dunlap begins all over again. But times have changed now, and William finds few portraits to paint. He writes plays and translates the works of European dramatists, but there are no theaters in which to produce them. A year passes, then two years, one afternoon, the penniless Dunlap wanders into the coffee house of his younger and happier days. Will. Will Dunlap. 
It's wonderful to see you again. Hello, Charles. Well, <laughs> how are you? Very well, thanks. Uh, but about you, none of us have seen you since, well, since the night of the fire. That's been over two years. Yes, uh, well, I've been busy, Charles. <laughs> well, do you remember painting my portrait? The portrait I couldn't pay for? <laughs> of course. And the time you gave me a part in your first play when I couldn't buy my own dinner? Well, I needed a good actor, Charles. Yes. Just as we need a good partner right now. What? We? Charles Brockton Brown and myself. We bought the New Park Theater. We need the best play we can find and the best man to present it. Well, that's good of you, Charles, but I haven't come to charity yet. Charity? Will, it's you who would be giving to us. Your talent, your, your craft, your, your vision of an American theater. An American theater. Perhaps at last, this is the time. Charles. Charles, I've written a new play. I call it Andre. The opening night of William Dunlap's presentation of Andre is a historic occasion. Governor John Jay sits in the box of honor, flanked by the leaders of New York society. When the curtains close after the last scene, and while the audience still applauds, Will joins the cast on stage. And then suddenly he sees an elderly man push his way through the milling crowd. Father! You here in a theater? I don't blame you for being surprised, my boy. And yet I'm proud to be here. Tonight you've proved that the theater is not a disgrace, but a glory. <laughs> then I'm still a gentleman. More than that, William. A great pioneer. Your Excellency Governor Jay, ladies and gentlemen. Not many years ago, George Washington was inaugurated president in this city. A few months before that, I had the honor of a visit from General Washington. Give us, he told me, the works of great dramatists. Give the people pleasure and education. Bring us the wisdom and the inspiration of great thinkers which all of us shall need in the days before us. Yeah. Tonight, you have been kind to my own humble play. It is but a promise of better things to come. On this stage and on stages still to be built in this city and in other cities, the ideas of Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, Sheridan, Moliere, of great men of all time and of all nations will speak to you to entertain and to educate. From this beginning tonight, we shall go forward to a theater which belongs to all the people everywhere in these United States. which followed, William Dunlap was to be hailed as the father of the American theater. From his pen flowed a total of 60 plays of his own creation or adaptation through the vision and devotion of William Dunlap, artist, playwright, and producer, the American theater was to become a respected art and profession, a stage which was to echo with the names of the great Booth and Belasco and Sir Henry Irving and Joseph Jefferson Moody. Well, the list of names is almost endless. But at the top of the list, the very first name will always read William Dunlap. <laughs> well, I I'll be back with a preview of next week's program in just a moment. But first, here's Frank Goss with a May Day suggestion for you. Have you seen the Hallmark May baskets mothers and teachers are talking about all over the country? They're pretty colorful baskets the youngsters can put together themselves without the aid of scissors or glue. Once they're made, Hallmark May baskets are ready to fill with a few candies and flowers and to leave on the doorsteps of friends. 
just as children have done for years, ever since the pilgrims first brought the custom to America. It's a wonderful way to celebrate the fine old custom of May Day and to teach little folks thoughtfulness at the same time. Yes, and here's a tip for you spring hostesses. You can add a delightful touch of color to your bridal shower or bridge tables by using Hallmark May Baskets as favors. They cost just 50 cents for a package of five different designs. So look for Hallmark May Baskets the next time you shop at a fine store where Hallmark cards are sold. You'll recognize them instantly by the Hallmark and crown on the package, the symbol you always look for when you care enough to send the very best. Uh, Mr. Barrymore, all of us on the Hallmark Hall of Fame are proud to join your millions of friends all over America in extending our sincerest congratulations to you on this occasion of your having completed 60 years in the American theater. Well, Frank, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I certainly appreciate it. They've been wonderful years. All 60 of them. And believe me, I'm looking forward to the 61st right here with you in the whole Mark Hall of Fame. Well, I uh, hope you'll let us congratulate you on another important milestone coming up next week, Mr. Barrymore. Yeah, well, what's that? Well, I know all our friends will want to join us in wishing you a happy birthday. Oh, my <laughs> golly, that's right. Uh, it'll be here in just a few days. Our very best wishes to you, Mr. Barrymore, from all of us on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Thank you, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's time I told you what we're planning on the Hallmark Hall of Fame next Sunday. We're going to bring you the true and inspiring story of John McDonough in a special May Day tribute. I hope you'll be listening. Uh, our Hallmark Hall of Fame is every Sunday. Our producer-director is, is William Gay, and our script tonight was written by Leonard Sinclair. Until next Sunday, then... This is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our cast tonight included Whitfield Connor as William Dunlap, Barbara Eiler as Elizabeth, Ben Wright as George Washington, Ted DeCorsia as the father, Harley Bear as Charles Cooper, and Betty Lou Gerson as Mrs. Siddons. On Sunday afternoon, April 26th, there will be a special Hallmark Hall of Fame program. Hallmark Cards will present Mr. Maurice Evans in his two-hour television production of William Shakespeare's Hamlet. Consult your paper for time and channel. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true-to-life story of actual persons who in their own way have contributed to a better world for all of us to live in. Next Sunday, we bring you our special May Day tribute when we honor John McDonough on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network.